A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and our cases this week, a first grade teacher who was shot in the chest by one of her six-year-old students at school has finally been released from the hospital. Miss Z, as her little ones called her, had the composure to get all of her children to safety before collapsing. The little boy who brought the gun to school had reportedly threatened to kill another teacher. The six-year-old has been placed in protective custody in a hospital. His parents say that he suffers from an acute disability. In a tragedy like this, what could justice look like? But first, a mother of three who has been missing since New Year's Day is now thought to be dead. Her husband has been arraigned on murder charges. Police allege that the man misled investigators to give himself enough time to dispose of his wife's body and cover his tracks. But police say that the husband's internet search history for things like the best way to dismember a body and can you be charged with murder if there's no body? Answer is yes revealed that his plan was not too clever. We are recording this on Wednesday, January 25th of 2023. Our guest today is Dr. Judy Ho, a clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, a TV and podcast host, an author, a dear friend of the show. Judy, we are so happy to see you. It's always a blessing when we have you at the beginning of the new year because you've you've always got such good advice for us. Hi. Hi. Oh my gosh. I'm so happy to see you. Happy New Year. I've missed you. So thank you for having me back. And yeah, you know, the new year is always a time for new beginnings. And I know that there's a lot to look forward to, but also there's just been so much tragedy already in this new year. It's just like hard to fathom, you know, with all the mass shootings everywhere. And then these cases, it can be tough sometimes to keep your spirit up, right? Yeah, I agree. And I do believe that we see some of the most horrific tragedies around the holidays and especially the new year. There's something about January that historically I sense um, is filled with horrible tragedy. And I don't know if there's any psychological reason for it, but I just always sense it. And um, I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. It's just it's just everywhere. And you know what I noticed? I, I was just telling um, the producers and the engineers before I um I got on with you. This is my three year anniversary on <gasps> the podcast. This oh my week. goodness. Today? It was actually last week the sixteenth and I met oh. you on January twenty ninth of 2020. I found it in my calendar. That is the first time I met you in person and for real. And I've only seen you virtually since because of the insanity of our world. Oh my gosh. It was so crazy. But congratulations on three years. And wow, it feels like forever ago since I've seen you in person. I guess it is a long time ago, but it feels like I've known you longer than that. Honestly, I feel like we've known each other longer, but three years is a big deal. This podcast is so successful and um, it's all because of you and the, no, the it's because of all of you. you. So it's amazing. No, it's because of all of you. Right. But I was like, oh my gosh, I met Judy exactly three years ago. How crazy is that? So Ugh, bon anniversaire. And Yay. <laughs> um, so let's get to these, these crazy cases that we have. I'm, I'm, I'm really disturbed by both of these cases, especially yeah. the one about the little boy that we're going to get to. But first, our our very first case is out of Massachusetts, where a mother of three has been missing since New Year's Day. And police say that they're certain now that she's dead, but her body hasn't been found. In the meantime, her husband has been charged with murder, and he has entered a plea of not guilty. Now, the husband has been under suspicion, Judy, since day one, because this is the thing. He never reported her missing. Her employer reported her missing. And when police came knocking on his door because of the employer, which was four days after she went missing, and and the guy, according to police, says, oh, well, since you're here now, I guess I should report her missing now. Uh, (laughs) What? How? What an afterthought, you know? Like, your wife is missing for days and, oh, hey, by the way, since you're here... Yeah. Maybe I'll go ahead and report this, uh, this missing person who happens to be my life partner. Okay. And the mother of my three children. But other than that, and so I think we're going to see here, and I'm really curious about what you think is, is 
again, he is just accused, just accused, and and says he's innocent. But my gosh, there's a lot of evidence, according to police. But just this, um, you know, this this lack of empathy. This is just like, oh, you're here. Okay, fine. Why don't you take the report? And when we're going to um, show some video of his court arraignment. Judy, when we play that clip a little later, I, I kept replaying it because he's standing while the prosecutor is reading the charges against him. And mm-hmm. he's barely blinking. He's just kind of staring, not really connected. And I thought, that is just so weird. Do people just disconnect like that in situations? like that? Oh, I think so. I think that sometimes that disconnection can happen because you're traumatized. Sometimes that disconnection can happen because you're trying to distance yourself emotionally from what's going on. And some of that distancing could be conscious and some of it could actually be unconscious. But I don't think that, again, this is the court of public opinion. Of course, everybody deals with different things differently. And if he is innocent, it's possible he could also deal with it in this way. But I feel like in the uh, court of public opinion, they're looking at this and saying, you don't even give an F about your wife. You know, you don't even have any emotions. You don't even care. Like, don't you have anything to say for yourself? You know, I, I feel like people are probably looking at him and judging him in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, his wife, 39-year-old Anna Walsh, was reported missing by her employer on January 4th. Now, Anna lived in Massachusetts, but she commuted to work in Washington, D.C. She worked as an executive with a real estate company. And on January 3rd, she was supposed to have boarded a plane to go to work. She never got on that plane, according to plane records, never arrived in D.C. And when she didn't show up for work, her bosses in Washington called the police and asked for a welfare check. Here's the other thing, Judy. The head of security for this big real estate corporation called Anna's husband, Brian, and said, you know, Brian, Anna hasn't arrived. She's we're worried about her. So it's not like it's not like he even got a warning or a heads up. Hey, people are noticing that Anna's missing. Maybe you should call police. Right. Exactly. I mean, what I think is really crazy is that there were days that went by and just the story just doesn't make sense. His whole uh, his whole version of events of their New Year's Eve and New Year's Day and what happened. It just didn't make any sense at all. And given what she does for work, it also wouldn't totally make sense that she would just be rapidly called into work because of some kind of real estate emergency. I mean, I, I, I'm not right. saying that's what happen. he told I'm police. He said, oh, right. yeah, she left early. She left earlier on um, January 1st because there was a real estate emergency. What kind of an emergency is there? <laughs> it's an excellent Again, question. I don't exactly. Know. Yeah. So on January 4th, the police go to her home in Cohasset, Massachusetts, where she lives with her husband and three small children, ages two, four, and six. Her husband, 47-year-old Brian Walsh, tells the cops, okay, I haven't seen her either. And he said... Um, why don't I go ahead, file that missing persons report, because it's all about convenience for Brian. We've got to make things mm-hmm. easy for him. And then they notice his car, that the seats, the two back seats have been made flat, and there is a plastic sheeting or covering in the back seat, and they believe there could be blood in the car. They're already very suspicious at this point. And before we get into all those details of, you know, he tells police that she had to leave early for an emergency. Before we do all that, I want to get into the background, his background. Generally, I like to save this for later, but his background is so intriguing um, and uh, criminal in nature based on accusations that I think we need this context. So police records uncovered that after Anna's disappearance, there had been trouble with the couple. Back in 2014, before they were even married, Anna had... Um, call the D.C. police saying that someone was threatening to kill her and her friend. According to CNN, D.C. police have now confirmed that that was Brian. Well, that's never a good thing. You know, we talk a lot about domestic violence. We haven't gotten a lot of details, but this incident is certainly something that should be on the radar. Absolutely. I mean, again, when we kind of look back into the past, there's always cases where the person has completely no record. Uh, But I think it's very rare. And even if it's a distant record or it's a record where there's only been one official report, what we know is that in the past 10 to 15 years, 
half of the women who are murdered are murdered by either their current partner at the time of their death or a former partner. And I think sometimes accidents in a domestically violent relationship does happen. Sometimes mm. it's not conscious. Sometimes it's not planned per se, but things get out of hand. I think that this was a huge sign that something wasn't right with this relationship, to say the least. Well, he becomes even more interesting when you look at some of the allegations against him. So Brian Walsh reportedly had a history of fraudulent behavior. According to Brian's uncle, Andrew Walsh, Brian and his father had a falling out after Brian allegedly ran off with a significant amount of his father's money. Brian's father was a very well-known physician in Boston, Dr. Thomas Walsh. He was the head of neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston for over a decade. And, and then when his father, Dr. Thomas Walsh, passed in 2018, he left his son, Brian, quote, this is all he got, best wishes and nothing else. <laughs> Whoops. Brutal. Brutal. I wish best wishes. Best wishes. Ouch. 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 Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Well, okay. Apparently 2018 was not a good year for Brian Walsh. Not only d did he have the passing of, of his father in the cold bucket of water that was the will that basically said, you know, you know, <laughs> you need to reflect on your life here. In May of 2018, Brian Walsh was arrested on federal fraud charges after attempting to sell two fake Andy Warhol paintings to a buyer on eBay. Okay, first of all, just even trying to buy an Andy Warhol on eBay, I think that, that should be your first red flag. These are exactly. very expensive paintings. <laughs> like, what are you even doing on eBay trying to buy an Andy Warhol But and thinking that that might be genuine? But okay, like, Whatever. Okay, but whatever, um, right? That's what he did, right? That's what, that's he, what did. he did. That's what he was trying to sell it and, 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 and looking for a sucker, really. I mean, I think that that's exactly what happened. You know, I mean, people, again, if you're really trying to buy authentic art, you're probably not looking on eBay for it. But, probably. And yeah. in April of 2021, Brian pleaded guilty to charges of wire fraud, interstate transportation for a scheme to defraud, possession of converted goods and un unlawful monetary transaction. He was actually on a pre-sentencing probation at the time of Anna's disappearance. Okay, so what does a man with a history of lying then tell police when they say, what happened to your wife? And that brings us back to what you were talking about. He tells police that they had dinner with another couple on the 31st at their home. He said that Anna left for work between 6 and 7 a.m. on January 1st. Okay, just about everything is shut down on January 1st, right? And right. 6, 7 a.m., okay, because she's got to fly to D.C. for this emergency. Yes. So this, this is a favorite part of mine, so please put a pin in this little nugget of information. He describes what his wife was wearing, and he says to them, and she had her Prada purse. Stick a pin in the Prada purse. The Prada purse is coming up later. Okay? Little nugget. So now things are getting super murky. Not only doesn't this story make any sense, Judy, but then he tells this insane tale. He claims, he claims that he forgot his phone that like on this new year's day he says i forgot my phone so i didn't have my gps and i got lost driving to my mother's house how old is this man <laughs> you got lost driving to your mother's house yes because he didn't have his gps okay uh, i guess that's okay. possible i don't know how long she's lived there but that's what he says and because of that he tells them it took him much longer to get there he's basically you know, police claim that he's trying to account for unaccounted time okay. in his timeline. Right. And that's the best he could come up with. So um, now he says what should have been like a 60 minute drive was like a 90 minute drive. And then he says he ran errands. He went to see his mother. He ran errands. He went to Whole Foods. He went to CVS for her. And then he was back home by 8 p.m. OK, the story does not make sense to police. So they check CVS. They check Whole Foods. Do they find him on surveillance? No. No. Nope. No. So now they're, they're trying to figure out, well, what was Brian doing? Police say that he actually was shopping, but he was shopping at Home Depot 
And according oh, to the surveillance God. video that they found, they claim that that's him wearing a black mask and surgical gloves, making a cash purchase for about $450 of cleaning supplies. Now, for some reason, this trip was a violation of his probation conditions, which has not been clarified for me. So I can't give anyone any more insight on why that is. So he gets arrested on January 8th, and the charges at that point are misleading police because now they're like, okay, buddy, based on what we're finding, we don't believe you're telling us the truth. And so you are interfering with this investigation, so we're gonna charge you. So while they continue their investigation, he's sitting in jail. And that's when the pieces come together, Judy. Um, Search warrant is executed at the house. Uh, They believe that they found blood and a bloody knife in the basement of the family's home. This to me is kind of scary because if she was indeed killed in the family home, presumably the children would have been there. Right. Right. They may not have heard anything, but... And the fact that he would do something like that with his children present. Yeah. That that. possibility is just start. I mean, I don't even know where to start with that and what kind of mindset somebody has to be in to put their children in harm's way in that way. Uh, Because what would happen if one of them did come out of their room or something, if this did happen in the family home? Yes, if it did. Uh, What would you have done there? Yes. It could have been very dangerous for them, very dangerous for them. Prosecutors also allege that Brian then, over the course of these days before he was taken in, um, you could see him, they say, on surveillance video at different apartment complexes, including his mother's, dumping, driving and dumping these giant trash bags into the trash bins at these apartment complexes. Now, some of the trash bins excuse me, some of the trash bags the police were able to intercept and and get, but others had been destroyed. So some of the evidence, if there was any evidence, has been destroyed. Some of it has been found. So in the trash bags that they were able to intercept and, and locate, they found DNA evidence allegedly belonging to Anna, Um, They uncovered a hacksaw, a bloody rug, some of Anna's clothes, her COVID-19 vaccination card. Presumably she would have needed that maybe for travel or work. I don't know if anyone was checking at that time. Um, So here's the other thing. The Prada purse. They found the Prada purse. All right. Her Prada purse, the boots she was wearing, part of a necklace that she owned, and slippers that had her blood and his blood. That, to me, I think is very damaging. Very, like, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's like, what is that, you know, what was that uh, indicative of? Maybe her trying to fight him off, you know, and her actually, you know, causing him to bleed at some point in the process. I mean, it's just so sad to think about what those last moments might have been like for her. And that she may have been killed in her slippers. Right. Ugh. You know, at home in your loungewear right. or something like right. that. It's the holiday, you're home right. with the kids. Right. So the most interesting thing about him is his internet surgery. The alleged searches that he made not only on his iPhone, but on his son's iPad. What did he say to the kid? Give me your iPad. I need to figure out how to kill your mother. I mean, come on. This is insane what he did. So um, police have found, I mean, they have the times of every search. And this is a search that went on for days. It's not like one Google search, capture all your information. It's almost as if, Judy, it reveals his thought process. It's like, oh, well, what about this? Well, what about that? For example, starting at 1134 on January 1st, Um, He Googles dismemberment and the best ways to dispose of a body. Then how long does DNA last? Pretty much forever. (laughs) I mean, unless you're able to, if we're talking about blood and you're able to clean it, but even then. So um, I want to get to that clip of the arraignment because I want you all to watch his eyes. For those of you who are watching, those of you who are listening, he barely blinks. And it's just standing there stoically listening. And this arraignment was on January 18th. He entered a plea of not guilty. And then the prosecutor read some of the evidence against him. So they're all standing in court and she's reading toward him. And this clip was 
provided by CBS Boston because they had live coverage of this hearing from the courtroom feed. So here's the clip. On January 1st, defendant Googled using his son's iPad. Some of the searches are as follows. Keep in mind that the defendant said he left at 6 a.m. At 4.55 a.m. on January 1st, he searched how long before a body starts to smell. At 4.58 a.m., how to stop a body from decomposing. At 5.20 a.m., he searched how to embalm a body. At 5.47 a.m., 10 ways to dispose dispose of a dead body if you really need to. At 6.25 a.m. on the 1st, how long for someone to be missing to inherit? At 6.34 a.m. on the 1st, can you throw away body parts? At 9.29 a.m., what does formaldehyde do? At 9.34 a.m. on the 1st, how long does DNA last? At 9.59 a.m., can identification be made on partial remains? At 11.34 a.m., dismemberment and the best ways to dispose of a body. At 11.44, how to clean blood from wooden floor. At 11.56 on the first, luminol to detect blood. At 1.08, what happens when you put body parts in ammonia? At 1.21 p.m., is it better to throw crime scene clothes away or wash them? Those were on the January 1st. So there you have the prosecutor reading this laundry list from the Google searches. It, it's, I mean, it's really incredible. Really, he's Googling things like luminol, how it detects blood, every little detail, the, the decomposition, whether outside or in a trash bag, does that accelerate it? And I've always said, Judy, that the thing about Google searches, especially for someone who does what I do for a living, if you looked at my Google searches, you'd be like, oh, yeah, uh, but I hosted a, a true crime podcast. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, I have similar uh, alarming Google searches because of my work in the mental health and the forensic psychology field. <laughs> but uh, it's a little bit different, right? This is extremely specific, Anna. This is this is somebody who, an hour after he started these Google searches about how long before a body starts to smell and decompose, he's already thinking about inheritance. It was only an hour and 20 minutes after his first Google search about how long before a body starts to smell that he's already thinking about what he's going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. That does not look good. That looks awful, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the level of specificity on some of these searches, like what is the rate of decomposition of a body found in a plastic bag compared to on a service in the woods? I mean, this is highly, highly specific. And I don't remember any case where I've seen this detailed and this clear of a path, as you said, of possibly his thinking um, mm -hmm. in terms of his search history and, and what he's looking for. I do get the sense this is just opinion observation. It doesn't feel too planned to me. Right. It do Because it the searches appear to be happening and we don't know because they haven't found her body. So we don't have a time of death yet. And we don't even have a cause of death. Again, we don't have her body. So all we know is the timing of the searches and the last time she was believed to have been seen alive. So it looks like he's doing these searches after her death. Right. I think that I, I agree with that. And I think that it's, it's interesting because there was also some record of his searches even before January 1st. I think it might have been a couple of days before New Year's Day where he was searching which state was the best place to get divorced. Yes, exactly. So that gives you a little bit of an interesting possibility of a motive that he maybe it was, a, again, a domestic violent dispute gone wrong. But obviously this relationship was troubled. He's already thinking about, well, where should I separate from this person? And it's possible that they got into a really big physical altercation and he essentially just lost control. That is possible. And that does make a difference when you go to court because it's the difference between first degree versus second degree and having that planned intent or not. So this could potentially work a little bit in his favor if it is true, if, if our observation that it's possibly not planned is true. And it appears that she was truly the moneymaker here. It didn't seem like he was, um, 
you know, especially with these alleged fraud cases. Uh, it doesn't right. seem that he was making any money. She was the moneymaker. Um, she owned quite a bit of real estate, it's been reported, worth a few million dollars. And the question was, was he going to inherit all of this if she were to pass? And what, if anything, would he get in the divorce? I don't know what he would have gotten in the divorce because I don't think he had anything. Right, exactly. It, oh, uh, you know, what is it with these bad decisions? This is the thing that drives me crazy. It's like, how now what are you going to do really right. like what what are you going to do now now you're in prison well in jail you're charged with murder how are you going to get out of this you may be found not guilty maybe you didn't do it but divorce certainly would have been a much easier solution and what about the children where are they oh. yeah they were taken into custody of course they were yeah you know I mean, immediately taken into custody he's uh, being held without bail again he's entered a plea of not guilty and he's got some hearings coming up and the question now is where is anna's body and how traumatic for the children so now they're now they're you know in C cps custody essentially i'm not sure what's going to happen if they're going to go to extended family members or they're going to stay at a temporary foster home for a little bit but how how disruptive and, and how sad because they're old enough to know why they're being taken away i think I believe that two out of the three of them are at least old enough to probably understand what's going on. Yeah, so, definitely the six-year-old for sure. And I don't know about the four-year-old. And it's interesting yeah. you mentioned this because in our next case, that's what we're going to be talking about. What yeah. is a six-year-old capable of knowing and understanding? Our next case is out of Newport News, Virginia, where a school teacher is recovering after being shot by her six-year-old student. It is a miracle that no one was killed in this situation, Judy. When this was first reported, I have to tell you, there was a part of me that couldn't even believe this was real. I could not believe that a little boy had taken a gun to school so young, six years old, and had aimed the gun at his teacher and fired. And But that's not the worst of it, because one could say, well... That is horrible. And maybe it was an accident, but the police have consistently said, no, this was not an accident that he meant to harm her. And my question to you is, and I know we're going to get into this is, can a six-year-old know and have intent like that? I believe that a six-year-old could possibly have intent like that because and this is very sad. I've known six-year-olds who have said things like, I want to kill myself, or I want to kill my mom, or I want to kill my dad. Um, and whether or not they really know exactly what it means to kill somebody and like how permanent that is. And like, if they ever can come back, like that's a whole other issue, but it's super sad that some of the youngest children that I've evaluated and worked with even as young as the age of four or five can have an idea of like, I don't want to live anymore. So they can have suicidal intent. And then by first or second grade, I've definitely in my experience seen people who say things like, well, I just want to kill so-and-so without maybe knowing about the permanence of what death means. They say things like that. So I, I do think that it's within the realm of possibility. That to me is so overwhelming and frightening I yeah. can't even fathom that because of, you know, we're talking about such innocence with children. Right. Right. Six is such a magical age. You know, they're still know. skipping. <laughs> uh, you, you would hope. Yes. You know, I mean, again, thinking about the cases where children want to commit suicide at that age, it makes me feel so sad that during that time when everything, like you said, is supposed to be magical and you're playing on the swings, like, this is the kind of hurt and burden that they're carrying. And uh, I, I can't really imagine that. I can't imagine that, to be honest with you. Even I've, even though I've seen this in my experience, it's hard for me to connect with that like idea mm -hmm. that such a young child could feel that way and just want to end their life. So, oh, Well, the, yeah. the first grade teacher is 25-year-old Abigail Abby Zwerner. And she's been released from the hospital after being shot in the chest by the six-year-old. This all happened in the classroom. There were about 20 kids present, and it was on January 6th. Police say that when Abby put her hand up in a defensive manner 
because the boy had already pulled the gun out, according to police, the bullet went through her hand and then into her chest. And somehow, this is the most amazing thing, somehow she held it together long enough to get those little ones out of the classroom safely. She collapses, passes out. Another person at the school manages to um, secure the boy, hold him down. Can you imagine holding down the six-year-old with the gun, um, restrained him until police could get there? The boy's immediately taken into protective custody. He's currently hospitalized. His parents say that he suffers from an acute disability which has not been shared with the public, the details of this disability. And they, um, the reason we wanted to update this case this week is because the parents released a lengthy letter to the public, which I think is very helpful in comprehending the challenges that the parents were up against, that the school was up against. And I think it helps us get a clear, big picture here. I think that's really important because I'm going to be honest, the minute I heard this case, I was like, what? A six-year-old did what? How did he get the gun? Where were his parents? Right? And you're like, and, and, But then when you hear what the parents and the school and the teachers were dealing with, with this young boy with some very, very difficult behavioral issues and challenges, oh, it just, it breaks your heart for everyone. Like, again, I don't know what justice means in this case because it's truly a tragedy. Right. Truly, And without knowing the details of his disability, it was one where he required parental supervision at all times when he was on school grounds. That was essentially what the parents said in their statement. How and does how does that even happen? Like, so, you know, if, if your child is of such special needs, I guess the, the plan that the family and the school came, came up with is that one family member must always be with the child at school all day. Right. I understand that it may be that there weren't any other resources that could be offered by the school and that there were no other schools that this child could go to, right? Perhaps, um, yes. Either because of finances or because of access in any other way. But it doesn't sound like the best plan, right? Uh, to be in a class of 20 people, if your child has this level of special needs that it requires parental supervision every time he is on campus. And I have a lot of empathy for everybody in this situation. This this teacher who is a, a hero, actually, because she got all the other kids out safely, all the school staff and how they responded. But also I, I have empathy for, for the family. You know, I think that people are probably going to be quick to judge and say things like, well, then why weren't you on campus with them? Or And that's even the point, the, Judy. Yeah, right? I, we didn't mention that when the shooting happened, there was no family member there and the family regrets right. that decision. Right, right. And so what happened that day? You know, why why weren't they with him on campus that week? And I think that people are probably going to be quick to judge and say, well, then why did you let your child go to school or whatever? But, you know, we don't know what was going on with this family at the time. They perhaps maybe were overwhelmed or maybe he was doing okay. And they thought, well, it's just a couple of days. Maybe he'll be okay without us for a couple of days. But I, I don't know all of the details, but I think having a child that has such special needs and is of the level of disability where you're requiring a parent to be on campus all the time, that's serious. And we don't know what his mental health condition is, but there have been children who are as young as six, you know, who have had really serious mental illnesses diagnosed like schizophrenia, for example. And I'm not saying that that's what this child had, but I'm just saying that those levels of severity of mental illnesses that you don't usually associate with younger children, it does happen sometimes, right? And so we don't know, but I, it is, is really, really sad. And they said that this gun was actually secured in their home. So how did this six-year-old figure out how to unlock or whatever that, that, that security was? You know, uh, How did they figure their way around that to get the gun in the first place and put it in their backpack? I mean, it's just, it's, it's scary and it's devastating. And, and it's not even the first case where we have younger children handling firearms in school. No. There's been so many cases. Uh, dozens of cases in the last 40 to 50 years where a child was younger than 10 and this type of thing has happened. And I I think, you know, what I'm grappling with is 
many times, especially with the younger children, not high school age, but the younger children, yeah. many times they don't know. You know, they think it's a toy they don't they don't understand. But for the police chiefs to be so adamant that this child yeah. absolutely wanted to kill his teacher and that it was not a game and then it was not a tragic accident, but something intentional is 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 so disturbing and unnerving to me. And yeah. um, here's the other problem. So the, the family has said that the gun was secured and police have confirmed it was lawfully purchased. Well, I'm going to be the first one to say it was not secure. If a six-year-old mm-hmm. can get it, it is not secure. Those two things cannot coexist. Right. Because whatever the security system is, it has to be to defy the abilities of a child. So absolutely, that's right. failure number one, you know, without question. Yeah. Failure yeah. number two. So there have been several reports that uh, the school received information that the little boy may have had a gun. This is before the shooting on the same day. And that they searched his backpack and didn't find it. Failure number two. Oof. Failure number, if that is true, that is failure number two. Where was the gun then if they searched it? Is it possible that no one believed he had a gun, therefore just, you know, went through his you know, Ziploc bag of Cheerios, a few things cursory, right? And we're like, oh, there's no right. gun here. Ordinarily, I wouldn't think so, except for this. Both the Washington yeah. Post and the New York Post have reported extensively the teachers at the school after the shooting revealed that they had gone to administrators with concerns about the child, including the teacher, Abby, who was shot. Abby wow. was his teacher. And Abby went to her bosses at the school asking for more support and help because she was struggling to assist him and I would read into that, yeah. keep everyone safe at the same time. Um, he, according to these reports, he had violent outbursts where he threw furniture in the classrooms. It has also been reported that he allegedly threatened to kill another teacher. This is prior to this incident and threatened to set her on fire. That's how he had allegedly said, planned to kill her. And what is disturbing to me, which is failure three here of the system, is that it appears, according to the teachers, and I'm going with the teachers here, that their concerns were disregarded by the officials at that school, that they weren't taken seriously enough. And this is what happens when you don't listen to the experts in the room who are in charge of your children's safety. This is what happens. So I see massive failure here all the way around, all the way around where in many ways this could have been prevented because the teachers saw the warning signs. They said, there's a problem here. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm holding that school partially accountable here for not listening to the, to the warnings of the teachers, including the teacher who was shot herself. Oh, absolutely. And I wish I could say that this is the first time that maybe administrators didn't listen, but I've seen cases like this too many times before. And I don't know if it's because they just don't think that it's fathomable that this could happen with a young child. I I mean, I'm not making excuses for them. I'm just trying to get in their mindset and say, you know, why wouldn't you take that seriously? Especially if it's repeated complaints, repeated concerns. Uh, You can't say there weren't warning signs for this child, right? Sometimes every once in a while we get that sort of case, like we didn't know they were troubled. Well, that's fair. That's becoming more and more rare on, as you yeah. know, because now we have social media and it's like, even if nobody thought he was troubled, then you go to the social media, you're like, whoa, like, okay, never mind. You know, uh, this is different. This is like multiple reports. There was already a plan in place where the parents had to be on campus. Why? Probably because they were afraid of the fact that he was a violent child and thought that parents needed to be on hand to assist. Um, the fact that he actually made a threat towards a, a previous teacher 
And I also want to say that sometimes when children do have, you know, special needs, of course, the teacher can feel a little overwhelmed. They're trying to manage them in the classroom. And maybe what the child sees is like, this teacher is mean to me, you know, yeah, because absolutely. there's rules, there's consequences, and they're sure. supposed to do that. Uh, so maybe that's where he developed his hatred for this teacher and the past teacher. Like, why are these people telling me that I can't do this or punishing me when I do that? You know, uh, when they're just doing their job and that's how you're supposed to try to help manage the child, especially within a classroom where you have to also keep the other children safe and create this learning environment where people can actually learn and, and do things. And so I, I you know, I, it, like you said, there's, I mean, you pointed out the three biggest failures. There probably were others. I, mm -hmm. I'm very, very sad because it really looks like this might have been preventable. I do believe that. And, you know, we've, yeah. we've covered cases before with children of special needs. Oftentimes, you know, the, the challenges and, and the struggles that parents, their parents go through trying to find yeah. a safe environment for their children to be educated. They have a right to an yeah. education and the struggles yeah. that they go through to find a proper environment, a proper school. And it is so hard for those parents of children with special needs. It's, you know, yeah. a, and was this the right environment for him? I have no idea. The school and the family would have determined this plan because there was a yeah. plan in place. So um, that, I don't know. It is not for me to say. I have no idea. Maybe it was or maybe it wasn't working. I, yeah. I, I do want to, I do want to hear from the police chief because again, his words, I, I just, I can't get them out of my head. So this is the yeah. Newport News police chief, Steve Drew, absolutely stating not an accident, that this child was not just playing with a gun, that this was certain and intentional. Here's a clip from his news conference from NBC News. She took a defensive position where she raised her hand. The round went through her hand, exited the rear of her hand, and into her upper chest. I believe that the actions were at or towards uh, the teacher, but you never know how someone's going to want to react uh, with a firearm, with students, um, and we're talking about a, a six-year-old child. I don't know what all was going through that child's mind. I believe she did save lives because I don't know what else might have happened if those kids would have stayed in that room. Judy, is there any way of knowing what could have been going on in the, that little boy's mind as the police chief is asking? I think that they'll probably have to look back at any reports that anybody has had uh, that the child has made vague threats or even specific threats towards his teacher in conversation, or maybe look back in his writings and his drawings um, to see if there was that sort of intent there. You know, um, it's probably going to have to come from multiple sources of information, but perhaps they they seem so definitive because there was that moment where, again, observers are reporting, it was deliberate that he pulled the gun out, pointed it at the teacher, uh, and then fired. So that felt like it was targeted as opposed to, oh, you know, this is a toy, like boom, boom, boom. Like, let me just aim it at random people in the room. Like that was not what happened according to the observers. So I think they're probably just using that. And then like he already said, those previous warning signs and reports that he did meet did say that he wanted to kill a previous teacher too. And they're trying to put this together, you know, but it is hard. It is really, really hard to make that statement that a six-year-old, this first grader could just have these plans to, to take someone else's life. It is really, really, really sad. Mm -hmm. And the police chief said that the first thing, um, you know, the kids call uh, Abby, Miss Z. It's just easier mm -hmm. for the kids to call her Miss Z. Yeah. And then the police chief said the first thing that he asked of the police chief when she finally came to was, are my kids okay? Oh, my goodness. That gave me uh, chills, actually. I know. I, I know. hope she continues to recover. Yeah, I don't know. Can she go back into the classroom? I mean, there's that's a lot of trauma to be afraid of your, yeah. your of a little six year old shooting you. That's a lot. That's a lot. That a lot. She's gonna need a lot of people have been traumatized by this. She has been yeah. the teacher. Abby's been traumatized. The yeah. little children who witnessed this in the classroom. The other little children who were let out of their classrooms because teachers heard 
gunshots and got their yeah. children out to safety. So the children who heard it then found out what happened. I mean, the whole school w- was closed for like a week or more um, to mm-hmm. give everyone a chance to begin to process this. But there are a lot of people who've been affected here. This is just, yeah. it's its shocking, absolutely shocking. So, you know, we said that the, the family released a statement. It's a really lengthy statement, but I really feel yeah. the obligation that we need We need to hear this whole statement because we're all having such mixed feelings and we're like trying to understand. So bear with me. I want to read it to you because I think it's really important if we're going to understand what happened that day and what we can do to maybe prevent this when I believe what we have here is a complete system failure. Our heart goes out to our son's teacher when we pray for her healing in the aftermath of such an unimaginable tragedy as she selflessly served our son and the children in the school. She has worked diligently and compassionately to support our family as we sought the best education and learning environment for our son. We thank her for her courage, her grace, and sacrifice. We grieve alongside all of the other teachers, families, administrators for how this horrific incident has impacted them, our community, and the nation. Clearly, They feel horrible about what has happened to the teacher and that she really was trying to work with them. And they appreciate that, Judy, right? Yeah. The the family goes on to say, we have been cooperating with local and federal enforcement to understand how this could have happened. We have found that there are no easy answers or simple explanations, but we would like to share additional facts previously unknown to the public in hopes that they may ease the dissonance that we're all grappling with and prevent something like this from happening again. And this is where we get some understanding about what's been going on with this family. Our family has always been committed to responsible gun ownership and keeping firearms out of the reach of children. The firearm our son accessed was secured. Again, I have to question, it can't be secure if he has the gun. I mean, it's just there, it is not gray. Um, It's just not gray. The next part is, While our son's privacy interests are important, transparency in this matter is a valid community interest. Our son suffers from an acute disability and was under a care plan at school that included his mother or father attending school with him and accompanying him to class every day day. Additionally, our son has benefited from an extensive community of care that also includes his grandparents working alongside us and other caregivers to ensure his needs and accommodations are met. The week of the shooting was the first week that we were not in class with him. We will regret our absence on this day for the rest of our lives. So what does that part tell you, Judy, about the level of intensive supervision that he needed is it usual to have the parent do this work in a school no no absolutely not but it could also be that they didn't have resource for a one-on-one assistant in this school so if there's a staff member who could be a one-on-one then that would be usually the accommodation that i usually see it's possible that they said, well, the parent has to be responsible because we don't have that resource. Or it could be that the parent has to be responsible because no one else can handle this child. This is how scary his behaviors are, you know? So without more information, it's hard to say because I know that not all schools have those resources, right? That's why these teachers are so burnt out because sometimes they're dealing with 35 children, some of which who have special needs and they have zero support, no assistance, and certainly no one-on-one assistance because that person is basically hired just to take care of the needs of one student. Right. Understandable. And this is the final part of the letter. Since this incident, our son has been under hospital care and receiving the treatment he needs. We thank our son's medical team, as well as our family, friends, and others who have offered support during this difficult time. We continue to pray for his teacher's full recovery and for her loved ones who are undoubtedly upset and concerned. At the same time, we love our son, and we are asking that you please include him and our family in your prayers. Yeah. Really sad. Really. Now, what kind of a hospital could a six-year-old be in? What kind of a facility do you think he's in? That has to be so frightening. 
he's probably being held um, still on some kind of psychiatric hold at a psychiatric wing of a hospital. Um, and, you know, generally we hear about these sort of like three day holds where when somebody has suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation, but you can extend that for weeks if needed, if you feel like the person is still a danger to themselves and others. And so sometimes people then get that extension through court. They have to basically the doctors and attorneys will petition to say, you know, we need more than three days with this person. We need two weeks. We need another month, you know, uh, and that could be possibly where he still is instead of at more of like a residential treatment center that's more long-term. You know, this is more of an acute stage where you have the medical staff available at all times and it's 24 hours uh, in terms of the resources that are available to him. Do you think it's possible, I mean, I'm not asking this as a legal question, but do you think it's possible that he may not be able to be returned to the parents because of what's happened? That's a good question. And I think as the case unfolds, we're going to learn more about that. But if for some reason, as you mentioned, the the gun wasn't really secure, for example, or there was any other kind of neglect on the parents part that seems very significant, it's possible that Child Protective Services could get involved. Yeah. Now, no one's been charged here. No one has been charged here. And based on Virginia law, it is truly unlikely that this little boy will ever be charged because there's something that they have in Virginia that's called the infancy defense. Mm -hmm. Um, And in Virginia, that means that their laws see the world of a child this way, that a child of this age could not legally legally Mm -hmm. know what he or she was doing, could not understand the intention and the crime. Even though you have the police chief saying, I I have no doubt in my mind, this little boy knew what he was doing. So it's really going to be up to prosecutors here. Unlikely that the child, what the child needs is is a lot of help and care without question. He, he needs a lot of attention. Um, so we the parents though, they might be charged. We don't know. We just we don't, don't know. know. So as we okay. said, like the school's been closed and they're they're you know the teacher's back and she's recuperating. Yeah. So how does the board deal with all of this? So the board has taken action, but. And it'll be up to all of you to, to decide and, and talk about whether you think this is where the, the money should go. The board made an emergency decision, a vote, that they are purchasing 90 metal detectors for all of the schools. They're going to put metal detectors even in the elementary schools. They have some metal detectors and wands at high schools and middle schools, but now this is this is their approach. And And I don't know whether that's right or wrong. I can just say that as a parent, you know, and remembering the joy of walking my son into kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third and the joys of elementary school when life should be as innocent as possible, you know, they're putting their resources into a metal detector. Would this have prevented this? I guess it would have found the gun. But if the school district doesn't have resources to assist children like this, Mm -hmm. I would ask... Maybe yeah. some of that money needs to go to help the children. I right. don't know. It'll be interesting to see what you all think. I, I have so many different yeah. feelings. I don't know what's right. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, obviously, we don't have any easy answers for something so devastating. So no, but no. we need to find some way to like, <laughs> we need to find some way to prevent this from continuing to happen. It's just happening too often. It's too crazy. And it, people are just trying to get their education and make a living and do something good for the world. So let's. We need to fix this. We do. Please listen to your teachers. Please. They yeah. are the they are the frontline responders. Yeah. They are the yeah. first responders for our children. Right. You know, I not yeah. I know they're not always 100 percent and we've had terrible stories about some teachers, but for the most part, they are angels on this earth. Right. Exactly. It is time for our comment section. These are the cases that you all are talking about on social media. Our producer, Will Updike, is here now with us. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. How's it going? Hey, Judy. Great to see you. Nice to see you, Will. What you got for us? <laughs> okay. So we have a former injury attorney who was recently sentenced over eight years in prison 
for stealing money from clients to fund, and I quote, a lavish lifestyle. Uh, so this comes out of, of out of Portland, Oregon, where uh, it's alleged that from 2011 until May of 2019, Lori Devaney used, and this is a quote from the press release, manipulation and deceit to systematically defraud at least 135 clients out of more than $3.8 million <laughs> in insurance proceeds she held in a trust Ooh. on their behalf. Uh, so I, I've been told often how this goes is like when settlements go out, it goes to a trust controlled by a lawyer. It's supposed to go to the clients. Uh, there's multiple ways to sort of like funnel that as we've heard of in in in, in any number of cases. But it's really unfortunate here because Devaney's clients did suffer some serious, some of them suffered some serious bodily injuries. There were a lot of them were in a very vulnerable position uh, and reportedly like she stole some of her client's identity. She forged insurance ch checks that were meant for them to put into her own bank accounts. It's just a lot of bad stuff. In total, the victims lost about four and a half million due to these schemes. But like the wildest part is what she spent this money on. Um, so according to according to the charges here, she used this money to pay for more than $150,000 in foreign and domestic airline tickets, about $173,000 on an African safari and other big game hunting trips, about $35,000 on taxidermy expenses for said safari and hunting trips. I don't know what $35,000 of taxidermy looks like, but I mean, I like do you have a whole elephant or something in your house at that point? Oh. But, uh, she also spent some of the money on home renovations and mortgage payments, uh, more than, and, and this was a quote to $220,000 in cigars and related expenses. Uh, I, once again, $220,000 in cigars is a lifestyle. I cannot <laughs> comprehend. I cannot comprehend it. Um, and this was the one that got a lot of people was over $60,000 in stays at a luxury nudist resort in Palm Springs, California. This one was the kicker for a lot of people. Once again, $60,000. I don't know what kind of luxury nudist resort that gets you, but I hope it wow. is top of the line. Mm -hmm. um, nice yeah. sheets. You get really nice sheets because, you know, you got to be comfortable there. <laughs> and it's a, they don't just wash the sheets. This is a brand new shit, set of sheets every <laughs> single time. Um, so, you know, they have not been used before. Uh, so she was indicted by a uh, grand jury in back in 2019 for mail, bank and wire fraud, identity theft and money laundering, as well as some tax related charges because there was no income reported on any of this. Um, and she was sentenced uh, on January 9th of this year to 101 months in federal prison with three years supervised release. And she's also going to have to pay more than $4.5 million in restitution. Sort of unclear how that is all going to play out. But a lot of people, um, a lot of people had a lot to say about this one. There was obviously a, a lot of outrage, um, especially given like the nature of the clients and everything. Columbus 99 said, though, outrageous. I do steal money from my clients, but that's to send my kids to school and invest in real estate properties, <laughs> um, which is something that we've been seeing recently in the news. It's a really, really terrible trend. Um, a lot of people notably were very uh, hung up on this idea of the nudist resort. Um Honky Kong said, imagine if they were presented with the charging documents while being arrested at the nudist resort, which that would be that 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 would have to be an arrest for the ages. Um, I you know, do the cops have to show up nude at that point? I don't know the rules and the um, body cam. I, 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 I mean, if the, presumably they'd all have body cams. So, right. <laughs> that's yeah, a right. lot of digitizing all the other people and their body that's parts. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Yeah. B-Man said she should get 20 years just for making an appearance at the nudist resort. Also, just as a side note, I'll, I'm going to show a, a mugshot of the woman here. She kind of looks like uh, an older, like she would be like a librarian, kind of salt and pepper hair, pulled back, tiny glass, like frameless glasses, very like kind of bushy eyebrows. We got a lot of comments that she stole all this money, didn't spend any of it on on like <laughs> eyebrow threading or waxing. Um, so we, we, we got a lot of comments on that. So I just couldn't include all of them. Um, but uh, Rima T's comment really got me. Uh, they said, just curious, where does a nudist keep cash on themselves? I don't know how money is exchanged at these at, at these types of resorts. Like I can't even, I can't even imagine. At the Korean spa, you know, you get like the little watch and you scan it on stuff, right. but I, oh, I we're getting insight it. into Will's private life here. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good Korean spa. I love a spa day.
<laughs> yeah, like a little scrub. Oh, yeah, those scrubs are just incredible. too harsh for me. I can't. I know. They, they, they actually really traumatized me the one time I went to a Yeah, I could never go Sorry. back. It's just like this, this like, it's so harsh. It's like, ah, my skin. I felt like poultry. I felt like poultry. I was like on a slab, you know. Right, it's, it's too rough. To like, the a, skin, like seeing the skin and stuff. It's too yeah, rough for me. Yeah, just like on a steel slab and just being like scrubbed like in all directions. And I just felt like I was like a chicken being like, you know, defeathered or something to get to get cooked. I don't know. It was really weird. I, yeah, I was, Judy and I, I can't relaxed. do the Korean spa with you. Yeah, sorry. That's all you will. I, that's all you I will. mostly do the pools. Like I'm a baby. Like I, I, I think massages hurt. So like a scrub, <laughs> like a, a scrub, like I, I have to like they have to be like so gentle. Um, yeah, I'm a huge baby. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for their comments. We'd also like to highlight one of our listeners. Um, we're going to try to feature more and more of you on the show. We want to thank everybody once again for getting us that 5 million number. Uh, but Anna, do you want to share this one? This one comes from Rachel Miller uh, on Instagram. That's at Mrs. Radowski. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but we will show it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. So, you know, you all talk on, uh, you leave your comments on YouTube and you share. It's like, oh, I'm grabbing my coffee now. I'm listening to the podcast. I'm going for a run. So we asked you, last week if you would start tagging us and kind of bring us into your world and we could share what you're doing. So Rachel took a picture of the console of her car in the screen and she was listening to the podcast Aww, and then yay. she posted on Instagram, quote, I take True Crime Daily, the podcast with me on the go. It's good to be reminded don't do crime while in traffic. Congratulations on 5 million YouTube subscribers, exclamation points, and a bunch of emojis. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for sending us that photo. We just, we love it. It's so cool. So please tag us on social media and then we'll just, if you know, share your photos with us or your videos or whatever you want to share with us. You know, but you know, keep your clothes on, you know. <laughs> yes, please keep your clothes on. And we're also, um, we're, we're going to be reaching out to uh, some of our uh, commenters uh, this week uh, to to feature you on a on a comment section or a little piece. We're still ironing out the details, um, but look out for your, for your direct messages in the mail. But that's going to do it for this week's comment section. Thank you again to the listeners, and I will see you all next week. So yeah. please, yes, tag us, tag us and share with us how you listen or watch to True Crime Daily, the podcast. Well, Judy, where can people find you, follow you? Because you're always, what's your latest project? You have so many of them. Yeah, I'm writing a new book on attachment right now. So it's going to be published by Hachette. Uh, it's going to be coming out next year. So I'm trying to finish up that manuscript now to deliver it to my publishers. But uh, that's what I'm working on now. And as always, I'm still working in my private practice, doing a lot of forensic expert witness work and also a tenured professor at Pepperdine. I teach, I do research there. I head up the research department. So I don't know. I always have my hand in so many things. But if you want to see what I'm up to, uh, especially some of the more fun activities, not just work, because I do also try to post things that are uplifting, like music and my cooking and, and things like that. You can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Judy Ho, D-R-J-U-D-Y-H-O. And you can also go to my website, drjudyho.com for free resources and downloads. And I really recommend Judy's Instagram page, which, you know, Judy, you always have very practical gifts. I call them gifts because they are tools that you give us to get through life and situations. And um, I really hear you on it and I try to implement them. I know the one about gratitude, you, you do this one quite often about taking a moment every day and you say that um, your special moment and gratitude is when you have coffee. Oh yes, oh yes, I look forward to it every morning. <laughs> it's my yeah. joy. It's my joy moment in the morning. Yeah. So I, I do. Yeah. I, I try to list the things either I write, I'll write them down or I'll say them out loud, um, especially on those days that things are a little dark and I can't quite figure things out. I try to hold on to the gratitude and and state them so not so I can appreciate them. I can truly be reminded of it. So thank you, Judy, for always giving us those tools and gifts. So oh, highly thank recommend you. It. And thanks for following me and, and trying to implement those techniques. And congratulations on 5 million superchargers. That is crazy amazing. I'm so, so happy for you. It is. We're really excited. We we, we love our crime family here. You can follow me at Anna G News. Um, I don't have any great tips on anything. <laughs> but 
Anna's Anna's Instagram is awesome too. Like you post really fun and uplifting things and people should follow you because it's a nice break from crime, isn't it, Anna? Like, oh, I I have to, you know, you need to, you need to mix it up in your feed. You know, you can't just be posting about crime all the time. I really can't. I I see this on the other side of you. So it's awesome. I really, I can't. I absolutely, I cannot talk about crime all of the time or I will just start crying. I can't do it. It's too much. I almost cried several times today with these cases that make me so sad. So it's Anna G News with uh, one N. Of course, you can find this episode and all of our episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's quite popular, you know. And then sign up to receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. And as we say every week, don't do crime. That's our podcast, everyone. (laughs) Bye-bye.